Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Overanalyzes. Today, we're going to take a second look at Transformers Earth Spark Season 1, What Dwells Within. Episode somewhere between 19 and 21, depending on which subscription you pay for. As usual, there will be a short spoiler-free section, followed by a longer full spoiler section, and I'll warn you before the full spoilers comes. And this is part two, because... I got a lot to say about this episode. Once again, I state my disclaimer. This show is, has always been, from the first time that Optimus Prime trumpeted the call to roll out in the voice of Peter Cullen, a toy commercial. And as a toy commercial, it works very well. For the first time ever, I actually want one of these toys. I want that Drawbreaker Stiggy Molak toy, despite the fact that they got the natural history glaringly wrong. It's a really, really cool design. I want a stuffed nightshade owl mode. I want another spark Megatron because look at him. He is unquestionably an awesome mech. So, by that standard, yeah, this show is doing the job it was created to do. However, Transformers has also, from the beginning, had at least pretensions of being more than just a series of commercials. I recall the Golden Lagoon episode that explored the dynamic of, even if the good guys have no choice but to fight, the, fi the battle is still raining destruction on the world around them and they have a part in it. It was a subtle, well-written episode that showed that the Autobots had a hand in the destruction of the Natural Wonder as well as the Decepticons, and it showed it with the brutal nuance of war. Had the Autobots not fought the Decepticons, the Decepticons would have gotten an advantage and people would have died. The Autobots had to fight, but that does not change the fact that something precious was destroyed because of their presence. To varying degrees of success, Transformers iterations have explored the nuances of morality in their toy commercials. Transformers Animated is famous for this. With the Autobots being the xenophobic gray in a black and gray morality situation. To the Decepticons, just outright genocidal mania. Other iterations of Transformers have taken pains to humanize the Decepticons, to expand on Megatron's motivation, and frequently to depict the relationships between individual cons as genuine friendship, something wholesome, something good. A reminder that, after all, these are people as much as the Autobots. Now, I'm going to get right into the nitty-gritty spoilers, so if you don't want this episode spoiled in part two of my analysis of what dwells within, then you can take the warning I am giving you to go check out the links below the video and get yourself a copy of The Absurd Humor of Humans Are Weird or The Heartbreaking Reality of the Flying Sparks Universe. Now. As I said, other iterations of Transformers have taken pains to humanize the Decepticons, to expand on Megatron's motivation, and frequently to depict the relationships between individual cons as genuine friendship, something wholesome, something good. That was clearly what the episode was trying to do with the subplot about Megatron being Starscream's abuser and Starscream's behavior being a response to the trauma of serving under someone who would abuse their authority. That was weirdly done. First up, how the previous episodes have set it up. Yes, Megatron is allowing the violent cons, the ones who won't cooperate, to be imprisoned by ghosts. But Megatron, despite his lord status, was shown as going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Optimus in order to defend the safety and well-being of at least the cassettes. There was no, absolutely zero indication before this episode that Megatron had been violent to the point of abuse with Starscream while serving as Starscream's commander during the war. Now, it might have been in the episode War Zone when Megatron was waxing on and on about his regrets during the war, but I don't remember seeing that there. Give me a shout out in the comments if you do remember justification for this dynamic in the episode War Zone. I kind of don't want to go back and rewatch it. With that mindset of tearing it apart, I enjoyed it too much. So, first bit of bad writing. We have a character dynamic sprung on us nearly two dozen episodes into a show that has a lot of filler padding. That there is just bad writing. But Betty, you say, of course Megatron is abusively violent. Of course Starscream is a cringing and, vindicti and vindictive as a result of this abuse. That's how it's always been, and no, 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 nada. Earthspark is an homage. 
a reboot of G1, not a direct sequel. They made that clear from the start. G1 Megatron would never have agreed to serve Optimus and Ghost. G1 Optimus was never going to give that much trust and leverage to a humanity whose excesses he understood all too well. Remember the famous G1 episode where the humans kidnap Bumblebee? These are different characters. This is a different timeline. This is a different show. If the writers are depending on the collective fan-in of four decades to fill in critical plot points about central character relationships, which is what they would have to be doing to rely on our understanding of the Megatron Starscream dynamic from G1, if they are demanding that the audience headcanon retroactive explanations, I mean, go ahead if you want to, that's what I am planning to do, but that I were having to do that because this is bad writing in the show. We should have seen Megatron displaying deliberate casual violence to someone entirely in his power at least once if we are expected to flow with this narrative. But we have never seen that. Megatron has only been violent in self-defense and has repeatedly been shown defending the helpless, defending people who are lower po of lower power than he is. Sure. Maybe Megatron is conniving and hiding things from the Maltos and the Prime, but if he is successfully hiding all traces of his abusive nature from the audience, then that's not good acting, that's bad writing. So the setup itself for this abusive relationship just wasn't there. Then you have the reactions of the other characters to it, specifically the Maltos. If the show is playing this concept of Megatron made Starscream that way straight, you have the Malto children seesawing between their familial loyalty to Megatron, who's basically their uncle, and a sudden and inexplicable sympathy for Starscream, who's always been the enemy, the bad guy. For all their entire lives, they've seen him that way. And the Malto children, both mechanical and biological, have shown time and again that had, they do still have a simplistic good guy, bad guy outlook. There was simply not enough on-screen interaction time for them to develop the sympathy that they showed for Starscream in this case. Case in point, the episode Home. Because Robbie's best friend did not respond exactly the way they wanted to, they cast off that friendship, tossed that kid into the bad guy box, and set, t took out of there. This whole scene and situation makes slightly more sense, if you can assume that Megatron is working a long scream. A long scheme. That includes Ravage being loose on the base, which we, know, we do know about, and, Star Sc and that Megatron prepared Starscream to know what will gain the Malto's sympathy and how to approach that. And with Mega you, have to, uh, you assume Megatron himself carefully preparing the Maltos to be sympathetic to Starscream. But that's one thing that we actually witnessed, and one thing you might infer from Megatron's behavior, and just two complete fabrications you have to have to get there. That is essentially just me headcanning a pretty complex behind-the-scenes plot that we've seen no indication of on screen. Uh, other than the fact that Ravage is loose on base after Megahon Tron vouched for him, and now Starscream is loose as well. And even if this patched together theory is true, if the audience has a whole cloth headcanon explanation, that means that the writing is just bad. Then there was just the cringe moment where you were supposed to think that the Deep Dweller is coming, and the supposed twist is that just the other Maltos. Yeah, that was bad writing and bad direction. It was too cheesy, too much of an obvious setup, even for that, t that TV Y7 audience. I'm not, I don't, I don't think that any child old enough to be enjoying the show in general is going to be surprised by that. Like I said, the writing quality is just all over the space. And let's just circle back to one more thing that I didn't get in the previous videos. Obviously, Agent Karen was letting Starscream escape. No doubt about it. Someone had a deal. Starscream knew the deal. Swindle didn't. Ghost deliberately let the three Seekers escape attempted to prevent Megatron and Optimus from going after them, and then kept the two grounders. The question is, why? Now we know that Nova Storm and Skywarp have worked for humans before. The logical conclusion is that Agent Karen is hiring the Seekers to fetch her the Ember Stone at Mandroid's request. Perhaps Agent Karen plans to pay them an Energon in freedom? We will see. So, 
What are you using, my wonderful viewers? Did Megatron organize the emotional connection between Starscream and Hashtag? Is he just playing a really long game here? But leave your, you leave your theories in the comments below. I'd love to hear them. Hit that like and subscribe button. Go check out my books. And peace out, my wonderful viewers. Do you love awesome science fiction books? Of course you do. If you check out the links below the video, you can get yourself a copy of Comedy or Tragedy. Humans are weird. I have the data. Humans are weird. We took a vote and Humans are weird. Let's work it out. Are the three comedy short story books available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo by Rakuten, Google Play. There's even some copies at... Powell's Books, the famous used bookstore in Portland, Oregon. Dying Embers, Dragons, Aliens, and Things That Go Boom in the Night, and, and soon Flying Sparks, more dramatic traditional science fiction novels, are also available at Amazon. Flying Sparks is still in the pre-order page. If you want a copy, you can email me by contacting the website to, to pre-order yourself a copy. It's still being edited. So check out the links below the video to get yourself a copy of some wonderful science fiction.